Well, I would like to thank the organizer, of course, and the uh, technician for trying hard to, <laughs> to make my, my Mac work. Uh, I'm going to talk today about a rather recent uh, project that was initiated by a national center of competence in, in uh, research in Switzerland. And the goal of this uh, competence center is to uh, do material design using computation. So many computational groups are involved, uh, group specialists in machine learning, large scale screening, quantum chemistry, and uh, simulation are getting together to try to uh, achieve one of these goals and, and design something. So here I'm going to focus on homogeneous catalysis. I've been giving this talk three times already. So if you have seen it, I'm sorry, but I thought that being very close to Tarragona, homogeneous catalysis is uh, maybe taking a risk uh, for me, but I think it could be a, a very well suited topic. So I would like to start uh, thanking the people who have been working on this project with me, Michael Bush, one of my uh, former postdocs who has a background in electrocatalysis and you will understand why this was important, Matthew Woodwich, uh, with actually my husband and with who I worked uh, quite a bit, especially on this project. And a new PhD student, Bazarin, she comes from Thailand. She started two months ago and she took over a small part of, of this project that is kind of extending at the moment. So I'm going to talk about concept in catalysis, but in my lab we are still very much focusing on uh, quantum chemistry tool and approach, and this expertise is actually very useful also for what we are doing in the context of design principle. So before I really uh, start discussing uh, homogeneous catalysis, I want to tell you a little bit about what is the uh, computational state of the art in, in other flavor of catalysis, and especially electrocatalysis and, and heterogeneous catalysis. And this is well represented by this volcano-shaped plot that was originally introduced in the 70s by Trasati. And uh, this plot is a pictorial representation of the Sabatier principle. And if you don't, that's the old principle that was in my uh, title. And if you don't remember what the Sabatier principle tells you, although I'm sure you do, it basically tells you that uh, Chemical reaction at a specific active site is limited by true process, by the binding of the substrate, and by the release of the product, and that if these two processes are well balanced, you will achieve the ideal catalyst according to the Sabatier principle. So this plot here is showing exactly that. I will tell you a little bit more about how they are constructed, but the main idea is to have a very simple descriptor that you can compute easily in your x-axis, and then in the y-axis, you have uh, a property representing the performance of the activity of your catalyst. It could be an over potential, a turnover frequency, a potential determinant step, or, and so on. So here, what do you see? You see that catalysts that bind too strongly and that will have problem to release the product will appear on the left-hand side of those plots. Catalysts who bind too weakly and will have problem to bind the substrate, they will appear on the left, on the right hand side of this plot. And uh, the catalysts that are ideal, according to the Sabatier principle, will be located on the uh, highest region of this volcano plot. So in a sense, it's kind of convenient because you cast the reaction into one single plot, and then you can compare, you have a global perspective of the performance of all the catalysts in a single picture. And you also have a key descriptor here. For instance, it's the binding energy of hydrogen, but that is easy to screen and that can be computed uh, uh, relatively fast. A downside maybe, and I will have to come back to that when speaking about uh, homogeneous catalysis, is that it's a pure thermodynamic picture, no transition state here. Now, if you, so, yeah, I should maybe mention that, of course, these, those plots are, are really well rationalized and, and used by, for instance, Jan Noska for Jan, in Stanford and Jan Van Smysel at DTU and by other group in the electrocatalysis community, even though it was 
uh, never transfer in the homogeneous uh, catalysis community until uh, we did it two years ago. So what is the state of the art, the computational state of the art in homogeneous catalysis? It's, it's still uh, having an in-depth mechanistic insight, usually at the DFT level. You want to investigate various mechanisms. You usually need your activation barrier. Uh, maybe the downside is that it's a case-for-case -case basis. There is no easy high-throughput screening way if you look at the free energy pass like that and no easy prediction a priori. But I want to insist that uh, I don't want to uh, uh, say that this uh, analysis is not useful. Of course, if you want to analyze maybe alpha dozen or catalyst or reasonable number, this is certainly still the way to go. So what I'm going to discuss is more in the context of a larger screening if you want to go, uh, uh, if you want to look at the performance of at least 20 catalysts or even more, then you should try to find something that enable you to screen a bit faster uh, the performance of you, of you catalyst. So here are, of course, many review from people in the room and uh, also other people who have really uh, uh, been uh, specialists in the field of computational homogeneous catalysis. We heard about the macrokinetic modeling yesterday. We can look at different uh, multiple pathway. There are also some effort trying to determine turnover frequency, and this is uh, still a very uh, of course, useful way to go in the field. But what we want to do here is to try to go a little bit faster. And here also, there is uh, some effort in the community. I want to men mention Aaron, which is an automated approach developed by Stephen Wheeler, where he can uh, create transition state and compute uh, EE automatically. Uh, we uh, discussed yesterday or mentioned also the approach by Morakuma the automated location of transition state. This is a beautiful work from Matthew Sigman, who also used physical organic relationship to try to develop parameters that enable the screening of the activity and selectivity of catalyst. And in the heterogeneous community, you have a lot of effort toward this high throughput uh, screening uh, way of looking at uh, catalysis in computation. So here I'm going to ask the following question. I'm going to see if this old principle is the Sabatier principle, uh, or more precisely, if those volcano plot that I showed you before could also be insightful in the context of uh, homogeneous catalysis. And for that, we have been uh, selecting one catalytic cycle, the Suzuki CC cross-coupling, because there are really a lot of results, both experimentally and computationally, that for this proof of principle that I'm going to show you are extremely useful for us for comparison. So I guess most of the people in the room are familiar with this catalytic cycle, but if you are not, you can just focus on two or maybe three steps here. The oxidative addition, the first step, that um, in line with the Sabatier principle correspond to binding the substrate to the catalyst. The last step, so-called reductive elimination, that corresponds to releasing the product, so we will have to balance these two steps. And also we will see that in some uh, region of this volcano plot, uh, the limitation is the transmetallation step that will also play uh, an important role. So that's the reaction we are going to look at. Now, if you read the... Um, uh, electrocatalysis literature, it's not so easy sometimes to understand how they construct those plots. I have to say that it's not always uh, uh, well detailed. So we try, if you look at our paper, if you're interested, we try to really uh, um, go very much into detail in the supporting information to be very clear, explaining how you go from here to the final uh, plot. So uh, the supporting information are are actually very detailed. But I'm going to try to give you a, a conceptual explanation on how you go from here to here. So the first step is to, of course, construct those plots. And to construct those plots, you have to select a subset of catalysts, not a large number, uh, but a subset that will enable you to verify if you have linear scaling relationships that are mandatory to uh, post-process them into this volcano 
plot picture. So once you have selected your subset of catalysts, you're actually calculating, uh, computing the free energy plot for those subset of catalysts, but here there's no transition state. It's just the delta G of the intermediate with respect to a so-called resting state, which correspond to the isolated catalyst and isolated substrate. So once you have computed this delta G of your intermediate, you try to verify if a correlation exists between these different delta G. And if the correlation exists, then you can post-process your data and move further and actually try to construct those plots. So if you uh, linear scaling relationship between the intermediate exists, you have to choose one of these intermediate or eventually another descriptor as a descriptor that will represent your x-axis. And you want this descriptor to be rather intuitive chemically. So I will tell you also which descriptor we have been choosing. Once you have chosen your descriptor, you have to express each uh, reaction, the reaction energy of each step in function of this descriptor and this is what you will have at the end. This is a schematic representation, so of course I'm going to show you the real one in a few slides. So a few details uh, on the training set of what we have been using to uh, uh, construct those plots and verify if linear scaling relationship, ex uh, relationship exists out there. Uh, we place a lot of emphasis on the quantum chemistry, actually, and even if I'm not going to discuss that today, those plots are also very interesting to give you a global perspective on the performance of the different quantum chemistry level, because on one, those plots basically cast the entire cycle into one single plot, and you can have all the catalysts appearing on this plot, and if you try to reproduce them using several levels, you can also have a very good idea of which level binds too much or too weakly, or that's actually very useful for that as well, even though I'm not going to discuss that too much. So that's the level essentially that we are using. Uh, this generates a lot of data. So within um, um, Marvel, this uh, center of excellence, we actually use IDA to manage all the data that we generate and also uh, to uh, automatize all the computation that we are doing. So IDA is developed at the EPFL by the group of uh, Nicola Marzari, who is the director of this uh, Marvel Center. So before go moving to the global perspective, I just want to try to get first few insights on the free energy plot of three individual catalysts. And here you have palladium with carbonyl, and you see that the last step, so the release of the product, the uh, reductive elimination is very exothermic. The dashed line represents an ideal Sabatier catalyst here. So here you see that basically it's a catalyst that binds too weakly because it's released the product too easily. If you replace it with amine here, you see that it's the first step now, the uh, oxidative addition that is very exothermic. So that's a catalyst that, bind, that will be located on a strong binding site. It's difficult to release the product when you have something like that. And you already see the value of palladium combined with phosphine ligand, which is much more balanced with respect to the ideal catalyst that is represented with the dashed line. As you can see, the steps that are more uh, strongly influenced by changing the ligand in this case are indeed the first step attaching the substrate and the last step releasing the product. So this is not a global perspective, it's just an analysis uh, of the free energy plot for few individual catalysts, three. So now let's verify if linear scaling relationship exists between our intermediate, because I told you that that's the condition to first process our data and construct the final uh, volcano plot picture. So we do have linear scaling relationship. So basically then we choose one of the intermediate as a descriptor, and our descriptor is finally uh, the binding of the substrate, so the first step, the oxidative addition, because we feel that this represents very well the, the strength of the binding of, on the substrate on the catalyst. So that's going to be our descriptor. And at the end, you end up with a plot like that, which I'm, which I'm going to uh, try to navigate on with you, where so you have you basically the binding of the substrate to the catalyst here, and you see that if it binds too much, so if the delta G of uh, 
this third intermediate is too negative, the potential determinant step, which is by y-axis, will be the uh, reductive elimination. So if it binds too much, you will be limited by the release of the product. Then on the completely other side, if you bind not enough, then you will be limited by the first step, which is the oxidative addition, by binding the substrate to your catalyst. And if you, are, if you fulfill the Sabatier principle and that you are in this middle region, you are still limited here. You don't have a pointy volcano. You actually have a plateau, which is uh, uh, represented here by the uh, transmetallation. So here, by convention, you have a minus delta G. So you want to be as high as possible in your volcano. So those are the, uh, the, the most appealing uh, catalysts thermodynamically of course, because it's still a thermodynamic picture here. So when we generate this uh, so-called molecular volcano, we were quite uh, satisfied to see that the coinage metal, in line with experiment, all the coinage metal, there's a color code here, appear on the weak binding side, and this is known. They have problem with the uh, oxidative addition. And on the top, you, you find the catalyst that you expect to see, palladium with phosphine, trimethylphosphine or triphenylphosphine as well as carbine. Now that you have a plot like that, if you were going to screen 100 or more or less uh, catalysts, you would not have to uh, go through this entire process again. You will simply calculate the delta G of this intermediate that will basically tell you in which region you are located and hopefully you will try to uh, identify catalysts that are located in this middle region here that is the most appealing thermodynamically. Okay, so anytime, I, I told you I have been giving this talk three times already, and, and anytime I, I, I have questions that are associated with new limitation, but also questions associated with new idea of how we could use it, so there's a balance here of a, of a critical but insightful comment and, and suggestion. And I think the two main limitations, we will agree with that, is what if the mechanism is wrong? A plot is more or less attached to one mechanism, right? So it's like analyzing your free energy plot. If the mechanism is different, then the plot will be different as well. So they are attached to one another. Although I like to argue that sometimes uh, different pathway could share key intermediate and could lead to the same volcano plot. So this is something that has, needs, of course, to be verified, but you need to decide on your mechanism before constructing those plots. What about the kinetic picture that was missing in everything I've been showing, and I acknowledge their importance, and since we acknowledge their importance, we have been trying to uh, develop more elaborate uh, so-called kinetic volcano uh, that I don't have time to discuss that now, but basically we took the hydroformulation that is uh, uh, kinetically driven, and what we try to do in this uh, um, paper is to, uh, well, first we, we actually demonstrate that if you change the steric endurance of your ligand, you get different set of volcano that are shifted, but since, uh, unlike Felium Azera, we like really to, to uh, compute a transition state, we like it a bit less we try to find a way, a bell spogliani relationship, to avoid the computation of transition state and to replace it by a, a descriptor that will involve less computational time. So you can do that. That's what we call the SOR for a structure activity relation, uh, relationship kinetic volcano plot. But that's not what I want to discuss now. I want to stay on the thermodynamic uh, picture and try to see if we, are, we can push this uh, thermodynamic volcano further and provide a generalized picture of uh, chemical reaction. And this is what we call the cross-coupling uh, genome. So what is it about? Uh, Suzuki cross-coupling is only one of the variants. You can actually vary your cross-coupling partner. You can have Kumada with magnesium, Negishi, Stile, Yama, Organo, Lithium. And all this will basically uh, change your transmetallation step. And all these reactions have, of course, very different tolerance to different substrate or 
or different condition and so on. So they are all used in different, um, uh, for different type of reaction. So this, all these cross-coupling variants share the three step, the oxidative addition, the radioactive elimination, and the transmetallation. So what we wanted to try to have, it's a global picture of all these uh, cross-coupling reaction. And if you reproduce the two-dimensional volcano plot for each of these cross-coupling variants, you see that you have exactly the same uh, right and left uh, border here, but what is changing, of course, since you change the cross-coupling partner, is the plateau, the height of the plateau and the broadness of the plateau. And that's the only variation you see. And at the two extreme, you see that for the organolithium, the plateau is much higher, so thermodynamically it means more favorable, but it's very narrow, which means that only few catalysts will actually be on the top if you use those organolithium as a transmetallation partner. At the extreme, you have Iyama, which has a much lower plateau, so thermodynamically it's uh, less favorable, but the plateau is very broad, which means that you will have many catalysts that will uh, become favorable with this cross-coupling scheme. And you have intermediary situation here. So can you try to represent all these cross-coupling variant in one single picture? That's what we have been trying to do. Another representation of this uh, six two-dimensional volcano plot is this one, but actually the true representation is to have a three-dimensional plot like this one, where you will cut uh, vertically, and when you have your x-axis here that probe the Sabatier principle, and that basically uh, if you move along this x-axis, you will have the different interaction strength between the substrate and, and uh, your catalyst. The influence of the cross-coupling partner is now on the y-axis here, so it's another descriptor. You have now two parameters, not only one that you can change and screen. So you see the influence of the cross-coupling partner here. And the z-axis is, of course, still the energy needed to complete the thermodynamically most difficult step for a given value of your parameter x and y. So I think that's quite interesting to see this plot like that. And last way to see exactly the same thing, but it's just to make sure that it's clear enough here you can glue this two-dimensional plot like that and recover your three-dimensional picture. So you see that there's still room for other cross-coupling partner eventually. That could be a way to screen them easily. But what you really see is the evolution of the delta G of the potential determinant step by varying the cross-coupling variant. So now, I will insist a little bit on, on uh, the screening in a minute and how, can you do, how you can use these uh, tools to screen things faster without even computing. But what we actually found very interesting is the rationalization aspect that you can uh, uh, get from it. And here is an example. You have three transition metal here. The ligand is fixed and the ligand is R7 that you have here for this example. And you will understand now why actually palladium, regarding the cross-coupling partner, palladium is always on the top of this volcano, right? Palladium with the phosphine ligand, which basically show you that intrinsically that's a very good uh, catalyst, as, as, as we know experimentally and also computationally, and it basically fulfilled the Sabatier principle. Now, if you use something that, like nickel, for instance, for Suzuki, nickel binds too strongly, nickel with phosphine ligand. You can change the ligand as well. This is not in this picture. The ligand is fixed, which change the transition metal. But you can change the cross-coupling partner, and then you can make nickel works much better. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in line with some of the uh, experimental uh, discovery where uh, the nickel catalysts for Suzuki cross-coupling were synthesized much later, I think 18 years after palladium, while for Negishi, for instance, they were discovered more or less at the same time. So that's sometimes we try to, just based on this uh, thermodynamic picture, uh, try to see some correlation with experiment. And I think you could <coughs> use that as a first step to pre-select 
uh, some catalyst also. And then if you feel like uh, going to the kinetic picture, you can uh, only select a few uh, catalysts that, uh, that uh, are selected through this first uh, screening. So this plot could be useful for the class of reaction. I told you before, for catalyst operating to different pathway, you could think about having one parameter, one descriptor that is specific for one pathway, another descriptor specific for another pathway and try to see in which regime you are located depending on the, on the catalyst. You could look at different conditions also. Mixture of, sil uh, mixture of solvent could also be a parameter that you can vary. By functional catalysis, uh, optimal combination of co-catalyst could also be represented with a plot like that. We would like to work on, on uh, uh, variation. It's a bit more complicated, but a variation of the tool to look at radioselectivity. And also heterogeneous be, uh, with respect to homogeneous could serve as uh, two parameters that we would vary. Maybe let me show you a last example so that you really uh, have a, a big picture, which is the influence of the electrophile. Before, we basically changed the cross-coping partner, but you could also change the electrophile X, and now you will vary the oxidative addition and the transmetallation, so you could use different halogen or different also quasi-halogen, and this is what we have been trying to do, varying the electrophilic uh, coupling component. And here again, you see variation with both uh, the top and the side, because now you are varying several uh, reactions, so the volcano plot changes a little bit more. And using the 2D, you see that three flat uh, electrophile invokes strong thermodynamic drive, the plateau is very high, and are compatible with a wide range of catalysts. The plateau is quite uh, wide. Sulfone is uh, very reactive, or at least it has a very high top, but it has only uh, one or two catalysts that will be located on this top. You can represent that again using this uh, three-dimensional picture and you will quickly realize the advantage of that because you have here a dependency of, on the exorganicity of the reaction here with respect to the electrophile and you can imagine that with one halogen, for instance, with bromine or with chloroine, you will be located on the strong binding side but by using uh, iodine or triflat, you could bring your catalyst to the top of the volcano and even have more catalysts that would be located in the top if you go uh, down along this plot. So what I'm trying to say is that changing the electrophile can, for instance, be a, a way to uh, transform a, a, a catalyst that would perform poorly with one into something better, and that's useful if you have your favorite transition metal that you want to try to make it work or your favorite ligand, for instance. So a few words on the computational cost. Again, I told you that um, if you want to look at the behavior or get insight on alpha dozen catalyst, you are fine with the individual potential energy surface, even including the transition state. But if you want to look at 100 or even starting from 20, I would say, that's where those plots could become useful for fast screening. The thermodynamic volcano, which I have discussed a lot today, are, are really uh, are low costs uh, from the computational side. It represents only the computation of one descriptor. But within Marvel, we are also trying, together with my uh, colleague Anatole von Lillenfeld, who has been a pioneer in actually importing a machine learning model into chemistry, I think. And we're working together now to try to train this descriptor so that at the end you don't even need to compute it, but you can simply have its value on the fly and have a quasi zero cost uh, screening. So we are now at the, uh, we just finished, they just finished actually to train their machine learning model. They use the kernel which regression that we used yesterday, and they work very hard on different machine learning representation of the atom in the molecule to try to decrease the size of the training set so that we can converge to the error that we would like to reach faster, and this is a very big effort 
in their group. So the machine learning model for this particular descriptor, which is different from other descriptors which have been um, trained using the uh, machine, uh, using similar model, is now ready, and the next step is uh, uh, prediction of catalysts that will be located in this middle region. So again, I would like to thank my co-author, and I would like to add one more thing since I have a few more minutes, including question. Within this Marvel uh, network, we have been uh, very active trying to uh, promote uh, women in the field of science, technology, and engineering, and we have been created a master fellowship uh, for uh, women in the field of material science uh, that uh, this master fellowship will be associated with any group in Switzerland belonging to this network. But I don't want to discourage young men. If you're also interested in joining one of these groups, we have other funding opportunity for young men as well. And I think it's important to, to mention it. But if you know anyone who will be interested to join one of uh, those uh, Swiss groups and working on material design, the next call is October 15, but we will have another call next year on April 15. And uh, here it's the campus in Lausanne. It's not too bad. Uh, so I <laughs> thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for okay. questions. OK, thank you very much. Now uh, it's time for questions, comments. No comments? Very nice talk and very clear. Explain. Uh, my question regards the applicability of the volcano when you really want to predict finely, yeah? precisely. If you end up with a volcano that is quite flat on the top, actually all those systems falling in the plateau, you cannot discard in between them, right? Yeah, I think you're right. I think if you really want to, like the final fine tuning of your catalyst, uh, you probably need to refine it with, with the kinetic picture or try to select a few of them and go to the entire free energy profile, I would guess. That's something we can answer very soon because this is proof of principle, right? But we have other work going on that goes toward predicting. I haven't been predicting anything so far, right? I have been reproducing things that we know. So we are now working with some reaction where prediction is necessary. And I think we will see the value of this tool in this context better at this stage. But you might be right, fine tuning might require a little bit more uh, additional computation. But uh, it could be used as the first Yeah, because in the, in the hydroformulation case you show, the yeah. three types of ligands, yeah. apparently they, not, they do not fall within the same volcano. They well, do not form what? In the same volcano. No? Yeah, no, you suggested that there are three yeah, volcanoes. Yeah, because you have only one of them, that's what you mean. You have a monodentate, that's what you're... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's an... Yeah, I mean, this can be incorporated, though. I am aware of that sometimes you have... Uh, you, I mean, your mechanism deviate from the classical one, and this has to be taken into account. Thank you. I have a question concerning limitations. I mean, are there any examples where you have catalysts that are predicted to be very good in the volcano plots and don't perform well, and the, yeah. other, and the other way around, you know, that things, and the other way around, yeah. Yeah, I think sometimes palladium is predicted, uh, platinum is predicted to be a bit better than... Uh, it is observed experimentally, but that's when I think kinetics start to play a role as well, and you need to um, go one step further. So I will say, yes, sometimes uh, this has happened. On the new thing we are doing for prediction, uh, it's quite encouraging, and I think it's also insightful. There are many things you can realize by looking at it, but yeah, for the prediction, it's going to be very interesting to see if we can actually predict things that uh, are totally in line with experiment. These outliers are less than 10% or more often? Oh, less than 10%, not so many, yeah. yeah. More questions? Please. But 
just to add to his question, the, the false positive often are the very interesting cases. Because if, if I got it right, you, you rely on the fact that the mechanisms are as similar as possible. Otherwise, your descriptor doesn't really, how to say, describe the reaction properly. We rely on the fact that the intermediate, at least, are the key intermediate. OK, OK. Which and is, in a sense, the mechanism, but it's uh, really the inter yeah. it's based on the intermediate. And your, your descriptors, they're all energy-based. They are energy-based, but uh, it doesn't have to be. You could think of another. Of course, of course. Yeah. But, but here they are. And then the, the different coupling reactions you had, the Nagishi and Suzuki and the like, these are, but these are slightly different mechanisms. Or we focus on the, the three pattern. common step and the difference is then the transmetallation okay. partner. So some a, are activated, some are not. There's still but, a, uh, a yeah. common denominator there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the false negative, I think when we will use the prediction from the machine learning, we will be able to analyze that a bit more because then we no, will... I, I tell you, you may discover interesting things from the false negative or false positive. Yeah. The mainstream, you know, is, is how to say, well observed. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Questions? Okay, I, I have a, a couple of, 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 of fast questions. Perhaps the first one has appeared in some way in, in uh, some uh, previous uh, interventions. But uh, I, I am assuming that uh, you are comparing uh, catalysts that uh, are acting with a similar mechanism. It is possible to compare a catalyst uh, that uh, can work uh, in a mechanism completely different? Yeah, I think with the three-dimensional picture, the idea will be to have one descriptor representing one mechanism, the other descriptor representing the okay. other mechanism. And then you can see for a given catalyst in which regime you will have the highest, uh, I mean, the most appealing thermodynamic profile. So this is something that uh, we are considering. And that's, I think it could be a nice And uh, the second one, okay, you will have uh, um, talk about uh, kinetic volcano but uh, the first part of your talk has have been devoted to thermodynamic volcano. And I, I don't understand very well uh, how uh, thermo only thermodynamic considerations uh, can uh, uh, predict or discuss the efficiency of uh, different catalysts. Because as you, as you know, if uh, uh, Hammond principle uh, holds, uh, there is a, a, correlation, a correlation between uh, uh, activation free energies and uh, reaction free energies uh, of each step. But uh, if uh, Hammond principle does not hold, this is not true. And uh, what happened then? I disagree. Uh, I mean, I agree that the, the kinetics is very important. It's just trying to have the simplest possible way to pre-screen, in a sense. Thermodynamic is also important. It comes yeah. before. If you have a thermodynamic profile that is not appealing, you don't have to bother going further. So you could see that as the first step. And for the insight, I think you still get a lot of insight based on the thermodynamic profile only. But sure, uh, that's why we have this version uh, with the kinetics variant, because it was... Uh, okay, I, I think it's an interesting point of view, anyway. Okay, the last question? Not? Okay, thank you very much again.